pediatric intensivist. She is also a pediatric cardiologist. Okay, so she's dual trained and she's worked for more than 10 years at um, Red Cross in the ICU and she's just immigrated to Australia um, and starting a new job tomorrow. So we are very um, thankful that she's joined us today to really talk to us about the basics of um, cardiac echo and how um, as a pediatrician can you use echo to assess your patient. So thank you so much, Beira, um, and we are really grateful to have you. Yeah, and you can go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, two o'clock in the morning here, um, but I'm happy to talk to you guys. And it's not really an echo, it's more point of care um, focused echo that we're going to do for a shocked patient. So what we're going to talk about is um, how this echo can help us in a shocked patient little bit about the physiology, what we use to look for and how we're going to look for it and what to look for. Okay, so basically when you put the probe on the chest, you're gonna ask yourself two questions. What's causing the shock? And then once you figure that out, you want to see the response of your therapy. So come back half an hour later and relook and see the response. So with your point of care echo, there's basically three things that we want to identify. Is it the pump that's causing the problem? Is it the tank that's empty? Or is it the pipes that's causing the problem? So let's look at all of this a little bit into the physiology. So first of all, in my mind, stroke volume is the big problem when you face with a shock child. So if you remember, stroke volume is your preload and your contractility. And this is what we're going to look at in our point of care echo. We're going to look at the pump. Is the pump failing? And this will typically be your myocarditis, cardiomyopathy patient. And now in COVID era, we need to Look at that with our multisystemic inflammatory syndrome in mind. We also need to figure out if this may be a volume loaded ventricle, if there's a shunt, uh, for instance, AVG, or if there is valves that's leaking. Um, and then we will quickly look how to identify a big pericardial diffusion or a tamponade. And then we're going to look at the tank. Is the tank empty? Um, is it a preload issue? And then lastly, the last cause of a low stroke volume would be pipes. And identifying pipe problems is sometimes difficult on your point of care echo, but if you've excluded a pump problem or an empty tank, you can kind of make an educated guess about your pipe problem. And with a pipe problem, we, we basically meaning your vasculopathy and specifically a mismatch between the pump and the pipes. There's a mismatch between the vascular resistance and the heart's ability to generate a stroke volume. So for instance, if you've got a very vasodilated patient, you need to have a hyperdynamic circulation and a very active myocardium to pump big stroke volumes out to fill those vasodilated vessels so that you've got good diffusion pressure in the, uh, in the pipes to push that column of blood right through to the toes. <laughs> if your heart can generate that big stroke volume, you'll be good. But if your heart cannot increase the capacity to improve the stroke volume, you're going to go into shock state. The flip side is also true if you've got very vasoconstricted vessels or even obstructed vessels, like for instance in a coarctation or pulmonary hypertension, you're going to get problems if there's a mismatch between your heart and your pipes. If your heart can increase its ability to pump against that obstructed or constricted vessels, you'll be okay. But if your heart cannot do that, you're going to go into shock state. And if your heart needs to do this for a long time, your heart will develop hypertrophic ventricles, like if your heart is in the, in the gym pumping the muscles. And you can see that very easy on your point of care echo. 
So pipe mismatch between the pipe and the pumps. That's the big problem. So we need to also think of the development of our heart and especially in our small children. We know that there's problems with immature adrenergic receptors and vessels that's more leaky. So with low receptors, the ability to constrict may be restricted. And then the myocardium, especially our small children um, and our neonates, they've got less contractile elements, so they cannot increase their stroke volume and contractility much when they go into stress state. The only way that they can increase their cardiac output is by their heart rates. Um, so if they're in stress state, when there's a problem with the pipes, they cannot increase contractility and they can easily go into shock state. There's also a problem that the myocardiums are more stiff. There's less elastic elements and more fibrous. So they don't relax well. And if you don't relax, you can't fill and can't generate good stroke volume. And this relaxation is actually only normalized in mid-childhood, while your contractile part of the heart is normalized around about three months of age. And then we all know about pulmonary hypertension in our small babies up until three months. This is an issue. If they're septic, acidotic, or hypoxic, they will easily constrict their pulmonary vessels. And what happens then if the pressure in the vessels in the lungs becomes too high, your RV has to work a lot to pump past the obstructed vessels and your RV goes into failure. And typically we see that with neonates with PPHN. So this is what we'll see. A small baby clearly shocked. And if you look here, he's maintaining his blood pressure, but the only way that he can maintain his cardiac output is the tachycardia. And we see that often, but we can clearly see that there's a problem with the pipe and the pump that is mismatched. And then just a word about vasodilatation. Now this is difficult to see in the echo, but you will kind of deduct if everything else is ruled out that this may be vasodilatory problem. And the thing is to look at your blood pressure. If you've got a wide blood pressure, you need to think um, a wide pulse pressure, you need to think of vasodilatation. Um, if your diastolic pressure is less than half of your systolic pressure, you need to think about vasodilatation. And that is typically when the child will have a temperature spike everything dilates open and don't think these children are all warm and flush they can be cold and blue but they're actually vasodilated all these splanchnic vessels will be vasodilated now why is this important well you need diastolic blood pressure to perfuse your coronaries so if you have a low diastolic blood pressure there's going to be low flow in your coronaries and you're going to affect your heart's ability to contract so vasodilatation, typically you'll see this in sepsis, in PDAs or children with uh, other AV malformations. So let's get to our echo. So if you get your machine and probably a good idea to start practicing before you run into a child with, where there's big problems that you just get a hang of it, you, you will start with using a linear probe and we will usually use a low frequency probe, five to eight hertz. This is an eight hertz probe because you want to penetrate better into the heart. Um, and then you have to look on your probe. There's a little knob and that knobby or marker helps us to orientate our probe. Um, and then on your machine, if there's an option to select the type of exam, go for the cardiac exam. You handle your probe like a pin and always make sure that you stabilize your probe. Otherwise, you're going to slide off the chest if the child is moving. And this is your four basic views. So you'll start off left parasternal, second, third intercostal. Your marker is facing the um, shoulder on the right side. What you'll see is this type of picture we call the long axis, and it's a slit through the long axis of the heart. LA, LV, mitral valve there, aortic valve, and the aorta going out. 
and you can imagine the apex there and on top the RV. If you just rotate your probe now 90 degrees with your marker around about two o'clock position, you'll see this short axis view where you have the rounded LV with the papillary muscles and then crescentic around it, the RV. Then you can slide your probe through to the apex, put your probe on the apex, your marker around about a three o'clock position, and then you'll see this four chamber view. You can slightly drop your hand that you scan a bit more towards the, the sternum, and you'll see the four chambers. Typically, you'll see that the left side is bigger than the right side. Now there's a bit of controversy. The machine will give you this upside down view of the heart and if you're in the northern part of the country or in adult, this will be the way that you look at the screen. But if you're in the Western Cape, you'll push a knob on your screen just to turn this, uh, this image upside down, up down button, so that you can see it in the normal anatomical position with the atrial um, two atria on top. And then you can slide your probe just below the ziffy sternum with a knob turning to six o'clock position and you'll see the liver, this grayish organ. You may see a white line, the diaphragm. And you see the big vessels. This is the IVC and the hepatic vessel. And this will give you an idea about filling. So quick four easy views. So basically you need to think of your probe as a lightsaber like in Star Wars and you're using this as a beam to shine through the heart. The beam going through the long axis will give you this picture, slicing through the short axis, the round picture, and then here you give you the long axis view or the four chamber view. So what do we look for? We're looking to the different ventricles, the LV and the RV, and we're gonna look at the form. Is the wall thin or thick? Is it obvious abnormalities? Is it dilated or not? Is there obvious fluid around the ventricles? And how's the ventricles pumping? Is it squirting out blood or is it just dripping out blood? And then we'll look at the filling, we're going to look at the papillary muscles, the IVC, and then a little bit of lungs. So here we can see a four chamber view, and this is the Cape Town view in normal anatomical position. You can see this side, the left ventricle, a little bit larger than the right side. And you can see it's squeezing nicely. There's motion up and down. Um, and you can see there's horizontal motion as it's squeezing, a little bit tachycardic, but there's good squeeze. This is a normal heart. You can look at the wall, it's not thin. Um, there's no obvious holes, there's no water around it. And then if you look at the function, you can see it's pumping well, there's no hypokinesia. If you look at this picture, you put your probe on, immediately you'll see this ventricle is big and dilated, thin wall, the septum is bulging, squashing the left side and you know this is a dilated heart probably myocarditis or cardiomyopathy you look at this part also a four chamber view what you see is here the set is moving nicely bouncing the right heart if you look at this it's very little movement on the free wall and you can also see that the apex is not moving well, but there's more movement at the base of the heart. So you can see this definite segmental changes in the function. So now you need to think, okay, this must be coronary problems. And this is a patient with a Al Kappa where there is a congenital coronary abnormality. But in our day with COVID, you need to think of a Kawasaki type of inflammatory syndrome. Here's another example in the short axis. You can see the round ventricle, the papillary muscles, but here very little movement compared to that side where there's a lot of movement. So segmental hypokinesia. That should let you think of coronary issues. 
If you look at this, you put your probe onto the apex and you get this four chamber view. And again, it's a Cape Town normal anatomical position. You can immediately see there's a hole up here in the atrial septum. There's a hole in the ventricle septum and the valve looks funny. And you need to think this is an AVSD. And this is a ventricle that's volume loaded. You need to start anti-failure treatment. You don't need to be a cardiologist to recognize this. If you look at this four chamber view, again, upright anatomical position, you can see at the tricuspid valve, there's a big vegetation flopping in and out, obstructing flow in the tricuspid valve. So immediately you need to start doing blood cultures, start antibiotics. This looks like effective endocarditis. So it will tailor your treatment and you need to get your cardiologist to come and help. Putting your probe on the chest and you see this. You can see a lot of black fluid around the heart. The heart floats in the fluid. This is clearly a pericardial effusion and you will tailor your treatment you need to drain this. Is this TB pericarditis? Is it staph pericarditis? Is it um, SLE with some serocytis? So immediately it will change your treatment plan. And then if you look a bit about the function, you'll see that the chamber here is being collapsed by the big volume of fluid. The pressure in the effusion is actually higher than in the right atrium here and it's collapsing the atrium. And clearly your atrium will not be able to fill if it's collapsed down like that and it will not be able to generate good function to pump. So here we've got the fluid affecting the function and this is what we call a tamponade. And now you need to speed up to get someone to help you drain that tamponade. Then looking at the right ventricle, we're again in the four chamber view, upright anatomical position. And we said the LV is always bigger than the RV, but here you can see a big RV. Now you know your RV is in trouble. You've got RV failure and you need to adjust your treatment. And you need to go and find out what is causing this. This may be a congenital shunt lesion like a total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, but the moment you diagnose this RV failure, you need to get your cardiologist to come and help diagnose the detail. But you can already start your treatment because you need to support this RV now with inotropic support. Here you can see a long axis view and the LV is actually banana shaped squashed by this LV pushing the septum over. So what happens normally in the short axis view, the round LV and the RV around it, but as the RV starts to struggle, it will dilate and push the septum so that your LV change geometry and become D-shaped. And you often see this on the echo report, a D-shaped LV. And again, that LV geometry will not be good for circumferential pump function, and it will affect the stroke volume that the LV can generate. So here's another example. This is how it should look. And here you've got this D-shaped squash LV, D-shaped squash LV because of the large RV. If you look at these ones, your RV should be bigger, or should be smaller. And here you've got the big RV, again, a big RV and the squashed D-shaped LV on short axis views. And immediately you need to think RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, change your treatment strategy. If you become funky, you can use your M-mode probe. And usually we will get either a short axis view or a long axis view and just push the M-mode button that it measures the motion right through your ventricle, all the sides, the free wall and the septum. And what we usually see is this wavy action. You can see there's systole where the two sides are actually connecting when they are pumping and squeezing. And there's a period where there's filling, where you can see the fluid coming in. And again, 
the systole. So you see this wavy pattern and you know this ventricle is squeezing well. But look at this side. The free wall is hardly moving. So you know this is a myopathic wall. And the septum is moving a bit, but not a lot. And a big dilated area here. So this is a dilated cardiomyopathy picture. So this one is a cardiomyopathy picture and it will take you through a four chamber view. You can see slow motion. Then there will be a regurg of the mitral valve. You can see the blue jet going back, short axis view, and then you get to the M mode and you can see the flat M mode. So let's look again. The blue jet of the regurg and low contractility in short axis and in a flat M mode. So again, easy to recognize myopathic hypokinetic ventricle. This ventricle needs inotropes. As far as when files did reading. And so my first experience Okay, and then lastly, we're going to look at filling and we look at the IVC in the Ziffy sternum. And this is what it should be looking like. You can see the heart there, the RA, and then an IVC. There's areas where it's collapsed and a little bit dilated. And as the patient is breathing, you'll see that it will change the size as the inter. Thoracic pressure change, it will become bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. But if you look at this one here, you can see it's really collapsed and underfilled. And if you see that, you need to worry, my patient is hypovolemic. And obviously, you'll correlate this with the clinical status. And with hypovolemia, there will be very little respiratory variation as the patient breathes. On the other side, you can see this very thick congested IVC and there's usually also very little respiratory variation and changes in the size as a patient breathes. And this tells you it's an over-congested IVC. Now you immediately need to wonder what's happening with my RV. Is it my RV that's failing that I have back pressure? Or is it just an overfilled patient um, getting pulmonary edema? But always correlate with your clinical picture. And then filling, you can also look at your short axis view. So your round short axis LV, this is how it should look like with some fluid in the middle. But if you look at an underfilled patient, you can see there's very little fluid there. And in systole, the papillary muscles actually squeeze together that you can't see any fluid. And we call this kissing papillary muscles. And this is a sign of hypovolemia. And you know, we need to start fluid. And then lastly, you can slide your probe down to the dependent areas of the lung, just down from your apex. And you can look at the lung water. You will usually see a very bright line, which is the pleura. And from there, there will be these um, bright lights coming down. We call them comet tails. And normally there should be about three of these comet tails on your picture. But as soon as you start getting more than three comet tails or they become confluent like these, then you need to be worried that there's extra lung water. And that should alert you that there may be a problem with your LV contractility. Um, so another sign that you may be sitting with failure, um, contractility failure of your LV. So this is just to put it all together. When you put your probe on, your four different views, immediately, if you see big black water around the, um, your heart, you need to think pericardial effusion, look for signs of compression of the L, uh, RV and the, um, RA. And if they compress, you worry about tamponade causing your shock and then you need to get drainage organized. If you see a very hypokinetic ventricle, enlarged, usually with thin walls, if there's increased lung water, you know this is a failing ventricle. If it's globally, you think myocarditis, cardiomyopathy. 
if it's segmental, you need to worry about coronary abnormalities. And your treatment strategy would be to increase your inotropic support and get your cardiologist involved. If you see a big RV and the LV becomes D-shaped, distended IVCs with loss of respiratory variation, you need to think RV failure, pulmonary hypertension. And now you need to look at the cause of this, but you can at least start with supporting your RV with some extra inotropes. If you think it's respiratory of nature, adjust your respiratory support, maybe think of pulmonary vasodilators to add on. And then if you've got a very small hyperkinetic ventricle, if you see kissing papillary muscles and a collapsed IVC with not a lot of respiratory variation, you need to think hypovolemia and fluid would be your treatment option. Or if there's no change in your papillary muscles, they look normal, your IVC look normal, you've kind of excluded everything else, then you need to think this could be vasodilatory shock. And now you need to start your vasopressors. And the beauty of this point of care echo, you've started your treatment, give it half an hour, and then you look again to see if things are improving. So in summary, shock in pediatrics is heterogeneous um, and you need to really have an individualized treatment approach. And point of care echo is invaluable in this situation where you can quickly figure out, is it the pump, the tank, or is there a problem with the interaction and the matching of the pump and the pipe that's causing my shock state? By just looking at your four views looking at the form of the ventricles, the function, and then the filling. So 10 minutes, quick. And I think you guys should start practicing with the machines in your hospital so that you get the hang of finding the views before you get a patient that really needs your expertise. So thank you, that's my bit. And I don't know if there's any questions or should we wait for the end to do questions, Marty? We've got time for questions, and I realize it's very late for you. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, if they wanted to just pop it in the chat group. Um, not seeing any questions yet. Okay, then I'm, I'm going to allow people still to pop it in there. And, and Barra, if you um, are still awake later, yeah. then you're happy yeah. to answer. I just want to say thank you to you for an excellent presentation. Um, I really feel like um, our loss is Tasmania's gain and I'm deliberately going to keep you involved because I think we can learn so much from you and you just have such a lovely clear way of teaching. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks.